We'll be welcoming our next speaker back up to the stage from this morning as well. Continuing our astronaut theme, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Rusty Schweikart, who is uh, an Apollo 9 astronaut and the first person to pilot the, uh, the lunar module. He co-founded B612 uh, with Ed Liu, uh, and he's also a founder of the Association of Space Explorers and served on their asteroid, uh, the, its pan international panel on asteroid th threat mitigation. So, uh, exactly the topic you'll be hearing him speak about uh, this afternoon. So please welcome Rusty Schweikart. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, we're going to do another primer. Um, this one is a primer on a word you've heard, a couple of words you've heard used today, planetary defense. Planetary defense is protecting life on Earth from asteroid impacts. Uh, and it has many dimensions, uh, we'll get into that. So this is just an overview, you'll hear a lot more detail uh, later on. Okay, so the components of planetary defense are early warning, you gotta know where things are and when they're gonna hit, uh, et cetera, or else you can't defend against them. The second thing, a mitigation capability. And that word is important, mitigation means to reduce the impact of, no pun on the use of the word impact, but to reduce the effect of some problem. And the ultimate reduction of the effect of the problem is to eliminate it. So deflection would eliminate, you know, but if you get out of the way, that's mitigation. So, okay. And then the third issue, which people don't generally recognize that we'll get into at the end of the presentation, a standing geopolitical decision process. That's a complicated set of words, but you'll get it when we get there. Okay, so let's take them one at a time. Early warning, you gotta do uh, a number of things. Oop, let me go back here. Now it went all the way back. <laughs> okay, uh, pardon, we're, we're trying to make this thing work, but it seems to have a mind of its own. Okay, so you gotta, for early warning, you have to find them first discovery, you've got to track them, which means you find them a number, you know, time after time, and you can plot their orbit, you've got to determine the orbit, and when you determine the orbit of an asteroid, you know the orbit of the Earth, you can figure out whether you're going to have an impact, you can predict impacts. So that's the early warning process. Let's take them uh, one at a time. Okay, let's see if we can make it work. Okay, so how do you find them? All right, well, we find them generally using optical telescopes. Uh, most of these things, uh, well, they do. All of them reflect sunlight. As I said earlier this morning, they're all quite dark. So the smaller they are, obviously, the harder they are to find. We've already found most of the big ones, but the smaller ones have to get much closer before we can see them. So they get harder and harder to find as we get to the smaller and smaller objects. And that's where we are right now. We found most of the big ones, but there are many, many, many more of the smaller ones that are still very dangerous. So we use optical telescopes, uh, and there are several around the world, most of them funded by NASA as part of what's called the Space Guard Survey. Uh, if an asteroid gets close enough to the Earth, uh, we also, from time to time, can use radar. This is the biggest radar in the world, the Arecibo uh, uh, radar dish in uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, and radar is very helpful in pinning down the orbit if the asteroid comes close enough that you can use it. But it has to be pretty close to the Earth before radar will work. So they're not very good for search, but they're okay if they come close enough to pin down the orbit. What we really like are telescopes in space, and there's been one infrared sensing telescope in space called NEOWISE, um, and that uh, flew five years ago or so and produced some interesting data, but it was a pretty small telescope. And what we're interested in now, and the reason we want all of you to get this sticker that I'm wearing here, thank you, I see a number of them out there, sign the 100x declaration so that we end up with, an, with a capable infrared telescope in space. 
it's green and it's not going. <laughs> okay, there we go. So that's an example. This is the B612 proposed infrared telescope called Sentinel. NASA has another one that's being looked at right now called NeoCam. But the point is we need to get a capable infrared sensing telescope in space to fill in the 99% of dangerous objects that we don't even know about yet. We only know about 1%. So we need to get the other 99%. So that's finding them and tracking them. Once the telescopes pick these things up, they report in to uh, the Minor Planet Center who collects all this information. In the upper left there, on the lower right, you can see the kind of data that uh, comes in to the Minor Planet Center thousands of times a day. There are thousands and thousands of observations made every night of asteroids. Most of them have been seen before, some of them have not, and a few of them who, that have not and are seen for the first time are near Earth objects instead of objects in the main belt. So every night, telescopes from around the world are sending in all of these observations to this clearinghouse in Boston, well, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, the Smithsonian Phys uh, Astrophysical Observatory. Uh, the Minor Planet Center calculates the orbits, makes sure that the observations are legitimate. They put out the data and try to get independent observations to correlate with it, but they then make the first determination of the orbits, and they send them out to JPL in particular, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, and also to a sort of parallel site in Italy, which is called Neodice. And both of those places, the Sentry program in uh, at JPL, and down on the lower left, you see Paul Chodas, whom you'll see on television from time to time. But they all calculate, they make more precise predictions of the orbit or calculations of the orbit, and they predict forward in time to see over the next 100 years, is there going to be an impact with the Earth of each one of the asteroids that is discovered? And all of that is then published on the web. And here you see the Near Earth Object Program. Uh, and I think, oop, nope, back. <laughs> it's, okay. Uh, JPL, you can get this, this is neo, neo, neo dot jpl dot nasa dot gov. And this, is, this will give you this page. It's in the open literature. There's nothing that's classified or privately held. This is all published every day on the web. And you can see the number of asteroids that we found, 12,700 as of this morning. Um, and of those 12,000, about uh, 585 have some probability of impact in the Earth in the next 100 years. And you can read all about this on the web. So that's the prediction of impacts. Okay, the next thing uh, we said we needed is a mitigation cap capability. Well, m again, mitigation comes in two forms, civil defense, which basically says in one way or another, get the heck out of the way, okay, or prevention, deflect the asteroid if we know about it early enough so that it doesn't even hit the Earth. Obviously, the, the last one is the best thing to do, but that, especially if it's a relatively small asteroid, that may cost too much to deflect it if it's a small asteroid. It's probably cheaper to evacuate an area, okay? So let's look at mitigation. Uh, before we get into mitigation, I wanna take time out to introduce one other um, early warning junior, um, and that is the ATLAS uh, program. What we realized a few years ago was that if you look at asteroids that hit the Earth, don't look at the ones that go nearby, but just take asteroids that hit the Earth and then go backward in time and say, where were they in the sky before they hit? And generally speaking, they're in two directions. They're either in the direction of the sun or near, near the sun, or they're in the opposite direction, that is what's called opposition, that is the anti-solar point in the night sky. And those are the two 
preferred directions that things that hit the Earth come from. So with that, what we, re what we realized is that with relatively small telescopes, we can look in the night sky at the opposition point and we should be able to see things that are going to actually hit the Earth. It's like being at the end of a runway near an airport and looking up final approach. You want to see a great scene of airplanes landing? Well, look up final approach and they're going to come right at you. That's what we, can, we realize we can do. Now, you can't do it for the other half of the asteroids that come from out of the sun because you can't use telescopes looking at the sun. And you can't see them. Right? So we realized that hypothetically by doing this with relatively cheap telescopes, we could get last minute warning for about half of the asteroids that actually hit the Earth. So NASA a couple of years ago started funding this program called ATLAS. And it doesn't have to be this one, but the principle is there. And so by implementing this, you can, well, you can't read it on the bottom, but let me just read the bottom line here. It says impact warning time, and this is for this particular design. Uh, it says about one week for a 50 meter diameter impactor, you know, something like Tunguska, you get about a week of warning, and that's plenty. You know, we can evacuate for hurricanes in less than a week, or you get about a month of warning for an, for an asteroid that would be about 140 meters in diameter, which is really big. And I don't know if you'd evacuate there, you probably would, but that, you got a big area you've got to evacuate for something that's 140 meters. But nevertheless, for something like a Tunguska object, you can get about a week of early warning and evacuate. If you got a Chelyabinsk object, you're gonna get a couple of days of warning, okay? It's much smaller. So you see it later, but it's going to affect a much smaller area. So this is a very interesting concept. So for civil defense, OK, something like that Atlas program can give us enough warning that you can have uh, civil defense. And that would be either, let me see if I can get this again, OK. So you can shelter in place or you can evacuate. And uh, again, we, we, communities all around the world already do this for you know, floods or hurricanes or things of that kind, shelter in place, tornadoes. So this is something which is familiar to the civil defense community. But obviously, if you're talking about a, something Tunguska size or larger, you're much better off to prevent the impact in the first place. So let's talk about that. Okay, now in order to talk about preventing an asteroid impact, I'm going to have to give you orbital dynamics 101. Uh, sorry about that. There will be no test. <laughs> That's the good news. Okay, so if we look at the sun being up, in fact, it's almost where the sun is, but <laughs> uh, sun being to the upper left, okay, then uh, if you look at the Earth and an asteroid orbit, now we're looking down on the on the uh, solar system, and in green you can picture the, the Earth's orbit going around, the asteroid orbit crossing it in red. Okay, and of course uh, with the next click, the Earth uh, is going to pass through that intersection. Now, the important thing is that obviously that can be either a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional intersection. And about 4% of the time, that will be a three-dimensional intersection. In other words, all three dimensions, those two lines come very near each other, less than an Earth radius apart, okay? So if the Earth is there every year, then the question is, it takes the Earth eight minutes to get through that intersection, where is the asteroid? Okay, so let's go ahead, let's say this is gonna happen 20 years from now, and, a, and about a month ahead, that's where the Earth is gonna be, where the asteroid's going to be, okay, and let's just step forward, one more, and one more. And so that's the sequence of the Earth and the asteroid moving along their orbits, and they hit. But of course, these dots are much, much, much larger than the actual Earth and the asteroid. So the real issue is one of timing, okay? Again, the Earth is only in that intersection, the leading edge, 
gets in there, and then eight minutes later, the trailing edge of the Earth goes through the intersection. And so the whole issue of deflection is to either go up ahead of time and make the asteroid slow down so that it is going to arrive too late and the Earth will be through the intersection, or to make the asteroid arrive eight minutes early, in which case it gets through the intersection before the Earth. That's what a deflection is. You just change the arrival time of the asteroid. Well, how do you do that? You do that by either speeding up or slowing down the asteroid. OK, how do you do that? Well, there are basically a few, there are a few methods, and all I'm going to show are what we consider, and when I say we, I'm talking about B612 Foundation and all the work that we've done for the last 13, 14 years, we're talking about the currently available technologies. There are a lot of interesting ideas for future that need a lot more development. But in terms of what would we have available right now, here are three different ways. A kinetic impact. Okay, we already did this. You saw some pictures where we ran into a comet back in 2005, I think it was, right? Oh, on the 4th of July, of course. Uh, <laughs> But we ran into a comet, that's a picture of it, so we know how to run into things. Well, you can run into an asteroid uh, as well as you can run into a comet. It's a little more challenging because most of them are smaller, but you know, you can run into one. And when you run into it, it's just like, you know, a couple cars on the freeway, you run into it, you're gonna make it change its velocity, right? You're gonna make it move. Okay, so that's one way. Now the other way, uh, another way is that you can picture the kinetic impact is pretty rough. You're gonna change its velocity, but it's pretty uncertain. It's like, a, it, it's like a chainsaw to do a kidney operation or something. Maybe you get through the elephant's skin with a chainsaw, but you want a scalpel once you get inside, right? Well, the gravity tractor is what you use to trim up that very rough impact the changes of velocity, but you want it to end up in a very precise change of velocity because you don't want it to end up coming back a few years later. So the gravity tractor trims up. You use them in combination, one, two, okay? But if it's a really big asteroid or you only realize it very late or the decision makers procrastinate and procrastinate and procrastinate in the end, the only thing you might have left is the big dog, which Tammy Jernigan, Jernigan just talked about. Click, okay, there we go, the nuclear explosion. Now, by the way, there's Itakawa, and for those of you who have been to Rome and seen the Roman Colosseum, that's the Roman Colosseum superposed on Itakawa, so that gives you an idea of scale. Okay, so that's how we would deflect if we were gonna do that. Um, Let's get into the third element, okay? So we got early warning, we've got mitigation capability. The third element is a standing geopolitical process. Why? Well, picture yourself back to those two orbits. Remember with the asteroid approaching the Earth before the intersection? Think of yourself riding on that asteroid and looking at the Earth. That's what you're gonna see. Now the question is, where are you gonna hit? Well, you're traveling in a plane, right? And if you're going to hit the Earth, that plane that you're in has to cut through the Earth or else you can't hit it, okay? So, click. There's your plane, you're in the plane, so you see you're looking ahead and that's the plane as it intersects the Earth. And if you're going to hit the Earth as you're coming toward it, you're gonna hit somewhere along that line, click. Hello, there, that turned red, right? Okay, so if you're gonna hit the Earth, you're gonna hit along that red line. If you're gonna to be too late, you're gonna be over to the left, and you're on, still in the plane, but no, 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 don't click yet. <laughs> okay, and if you get through the intersection before the Earth gets there, you're gonna be over here to the right, okay? But if you're gonna hit the Earth, you're gonna be there. Okay, let's take an example, hit right in the middle of the North Atlantic. So that is where we're gonna hit. Now, if we deflect me, okay, if I'm coming in and they deflected me years ahead and made me arrive two minutes early, that's where I'm gonna hit. Uh, uh, 
there, okay? Or if the deflection makes me arrive four minutes early, I'd hit there. Not good enough yet, right? But let's say if I go do a good deflection and arrive eight minutes early, I'm gonna be out here to the right, and I will pass through the intersection before the Earth gets there, and it's a miss. That's a deflection. Conversely, if I make the asteroid arrive two minutes late, it's gonna be here, four minutes late, or eight minutes, there's another successful deflection. But if something goes wrong during the deflection, and I only get to move the time two minutes, I'm gonna hit here or here. Or four minutes, I'm gonna hit here or here. What I'm doing with the deflection is taking the impact point and dragging it off the Earth, either in front of the Earth by arriving early or behind the Earth by arriving late, okay? What do you think the people in Spain and France say? Which way should we drag the asteroid, okay? Ah, oh, let's go this way. But look at that, that's the United States. What do you think they say? Let's drag it this way, right? Geopolitical decision process. Okay, this is what's tough. You can't do this. You can't have the Americans racing to get up there with their deflection spacecraft against the Europeans and the Russians racing to get up there to make it go that way. We've got to have a coordinated decision process which says, for example, well, if we integrate the number of people who live on the line going that way, it's 500,000 people. If we integrate the number of people who go on this way, we put a million people at risk. So we do it this way. You can't go up or down. You can only drag the impact point in the plane of the asteroid's orbit. That's why we have a geopolitical challenge in terms of deflection. Okay, if that, if you, any of those red ones obviously are a bad result, that's what you want is a good result. You don't care whether it arrives early or whether it arrives late, you don't want it to arrive in eight minutes. How do we make this geopolitical decision? Okay, the, astro the astronauts and cosmonauts from around the world have an organization called the Association of Space Explorers. And we started dealing with this problem in 2005. We realized that the technology, the technological challenges of early warning and deflection were really quite simple compared with the geopolitical decision. And if you don't make that geopolitical decision in a timely way, you may pass the last point where you can act at which point you're gonna to have to take the hit. So it's a very criti time critical issue. And we said, okay, how is the world going to make such a geopolitical difficult decision? Who pays for it? Who handles liability? Who executes it? Do we trust the Russians to make it miss the United States? Do the Russians trust the United States, NASA, to have it miss them? Okay, interesting questions, but we gotta have answers and you gotta have them timely. So we came out with this report. We brought together a distinguished panel. If you look on asteroidday.org, you'll see quite a number of our international panel on asteroid threat mitigation members that we put together to recommend a way in which the United Nations could coordinate the international community in making a timely decision. That's our recommendation in this uh, report. It's available online. You can get the URL there. Click. Um, the process we started in 2005. Here's a scene from Vienna, the United Nations, where I'm presenting that report to the Outer Space Committee of the United Nations. Uh, this was uh, when we presented the report to the President of the General Assembly back in uh, 2009, I think it was. Um, and a couple of other scenes uh, last year, the recommendations from that report worked their way up to the General Assembly and the General Assembly kicked it back down to the Outer Space Committee and today there are two organizations that have been formed which are wrestling with this problem and putting meat on a skeleton decision process that we've developed. 
So that's the geopolitical process that's going on. Click. These are the two organizations. Click. People say, why take something like this to the United Nations? Okay, at the bottom it says, all hat and no cattle, but my God, what a hat. Now let me tell you something, the United Nations is bureaucratic, slow, frustrating, but when the United Nations decides to do something, the world has made a decision. Not just the United States or anybody else, the world has made a decision. So it's very frustrating, but the momentum that exists once you start something going in the international community is very powerful. So it's a very, very interesting, but a difficult challenge. Thank you. There is the overview of planetary defense. Thank you,